The Snows of Kilimanjaro, An Unfinished Story by David Solar. Ernest Miller Hemingway was born in 1889 and passed away in 1961. He was an American author and journalist who published seven novels, six short story collections, and two nonfiction works. He was considered part of the lost generation, and in 1954 he received the Nobel Prize in Literature. He committed suicide in 1961. A little bit about the story now. It was written by Hemingway in 1936 and was first published in Esquire magazine. It subsequently was released in other collections of short stories and is regarded as one of his greatest works. The film version, starring Gregory Peck and Susan Hayward, was released in 1952. It takes place at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro, the tallest mountain in Africa. And it's about a man at death's door who reminisces about the mistakes he's made in life. We've all heard it before, all the time in the world, all the time to get everything done, to see the world, to push yourself to reach new heights and achievements. But are we really in control of our own destiny? Do we really have the time to complete those tasks and to reach those goals that we so neatly structure our life around? Or do we have a silent countdown that will determine when our time on earth here is done? For most, death is by far the biggest fear-inducing reality. Some fear the unknown, some fear leaving others behind, and some regret what could have been. The majority of the time, death is sudden and without notice. But for some who have to stare death in the face, they can only watch helplessly as all the planning and all their goals simply wash away as regret sets in. Harry, the main character, has come to this realization that he is going to die of gangrene. He is having trouble accepting it and comes across in a matter-of-fact fashion which upsets his wife. Regret sets in as he knows that his time is limited and that he has never reached his full potential as a writer due to marrying his wealthy wife that he truly doesn't love. His oncoming death allows him to reflect on all the failures during his life. Harry was a member of what Hemingway liked to call the Lost Generation. This term described the generation of adults after World War I. This generation sc scared and scarred this by all the new devastating advancements of the new century that came with World War I, such as poison gas, tanks, airplanes, and trench warfare. This, these group of people let go of their values and became reckless, engaging in promiscuity materialism, and mental incompetence. As a member of the Lost Generation, Harry turned away from his love of writing and into the arms of a life of luxury and false love. Harry and his wife, Helen, became safe havens for each other, helping with each other's pain and loneliness. Prior to meeting Harry, Helen drinks heavily to numb the pain she feels about her first husband's death. Harry buries his pain in the extravagant lifestyle that he chooses, such as... traveling throughout the many beautiful cities of Europe, such as Madrid, Rome, London, and Paris. He also loves to partake in lavish ski trips with many beautiful different women, and also to partake in all the shallow materialistic items that populate a life of luxury. It does seem for a moment, as the end draws near, as if Harry really does love Helen. But then the narrator interjects the truth, describing him as slipping into the familiar life he made his bread and butter by. Although Harry's declaration of love are not true, he has begun to realize that she has been good to him and that she, he should spare her from the, his true feelings as he lay dying, which would undoubtedly be more hurtful than his lies. Helen also has regrets as she realizes that she may lose her husband for a second time. I wish we'd never come, the woman said. 
She was looking at him, holding the glass and biting her lip. You never would have gotten this, anything like this in Paris. You always said you loved Paris. We could have stayed in Paris or gone anywhere. I'd have gone anywhere. I said it, I'd go anywhere you wanted. If you wanted to shoot, we could have gone shooting in Hungary and have been more comfortable. Harry angrily responds, your bloody money, as he understands all the superficial things that his pursuit of luxury provided, in the end, has left him regretful and unfulfilled. As he lay dying and reflecting, Harry notes that he knows at least 20 good stories from out there, but that he has never written one. Then he asks himself why. He has, seen exper he, has, he has seen and experienced so much in his life. He has been in it and has watched it. His duty, it was his duty to write, it, it, but it never, he never would. In a way, the story provides examples of those stories and flashbacks as a method to portray the, the many missed opportunities to do what he truly loves, to write. The realization of one's own mortality can be an eye-opening situation that can either lead to depression and devastation or eventual reflection on a life well lived. Harry's pain is palpable and is sensed throughout the story. The grief that Harry feels, in fact, is part of our very nature. We as humans experience, we, we humans experience when faced with the impending death or the death of someone we love, a five-stage process of coping with the end of life. The Kubler-Ross model, which lists, which is a list of the stages of grief as denial, anger, depression, bargaining, acceptance. Sometimes steps are skipped or revisited multiple times on the path to finally accepting one's fate. Living with the burning issue of what if is a terrible burden to carry when assessing the life, assessing a life lived chasing superficial, shallow goals instead of taking risks, risking it all in the hopes of living a full life of, en of enrichment achievements and personal satisfaction. Only at the end when it's too late does Harry understand that he has wasted his one and only chance for happiness and personal fulfillment. Thank you very much.